go. Okay, it's recording now. You good? Yep. Check, check, check. Okay, here we go. Watch. Remember that the spinal cord is a relay station between your sensory nerves and the brain. And then the brain is going to say, okay, look, I'm going to do something. I'm going to run away. So that impulse is then sent down from the brain to the spinal cord to move muscles or secrete hormones from glands. So you have sensory coming back to the brain through the spinal cord, and then motor going from the brain to the cells of the body. Now, uh, let me show you this. This part of your brain right here is referred to largely as the brain stem. So the brain stem is where your basic biologic and physiologic functions occur. So aminals have a brain stem. You got me? Do dogs poop and pee and breathe? Yeah. I had a dog who pooped, peed, uh, peed and breathed too. <coughs> Ran around too after like a dog bone or something. So these control your basic physiologic functions. The higher portions of the brain stem are referred to as the limbic system. If you've had, anam not anamine and physiology, but psychology, you studied the limbic system. Yeah? Yeah, you did. See, I figured you guys out. This is what you do. And I'm going to explain this when I talk to you about the thalamus. You're going to go in, you're going to have, maybe you're going to have somebody for, uh, uh, somebody else for advance, and they'll say, did, um, did you go over the limbic system in uh, general? No, no, never talked about it. Yeah, well, I know different. You know why? It's all recorded. For <laughs> So I'll go back and I'll play it. Hey, hey, what kind of bilge water are you pumping? Here we go. The limbic system has several parts. Number one, it has the hypothalamus. <laughs> and we know what that does. I mean, cut it out, right? Do I even have to go there? Yeah. Okay, well, yes, I do. So the hypothalamus controls hunger, temperature, and thirst. Yes? And this is very important. <coughs> Coughing up a lung over there. The hypothalamus is directly connected to our buddy, our pal, the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus is nervous tissue. The pituitary gland, say that, pituitary, pituitary. Yeah, that might be the word. Did I tell you? you got to talk to a security guard. I'm not going to tell you which one. But the last week of class, they will have between $40 and $50. No joke. And if you tell them the right word, they will give you between $40 and $50. Courtesy of Timmy. See, that's like a little gift for you guys. Ain't that nice? And if he doesn't give it away, then he'll probably take it. So go and ask him the word. The pituitary gland is glandular. Better get this. The hypothalamus, in many respects, controls the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus actually makes hormones and then sends them to the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland releases them. The hormones that the pituitary gland release are number one, Oxytocin. Oxytocin. Do you know what oxytocin's for? Um, that begins the production of uh, milk, yes. And 
when your uterus is contracting do you, and the baby's trying to pop out, do you want your uterus to contract harder or weaker? Harder. You want it to contract harder and more frequently. So when that little baby's come, head coming down the birth canal into the cervix, it stretches the cervix. And that sends a signal to the hypothalamus to begin the production of oxytocin. And oxytocin then from the hypothalamus travels to the pituitary gland and then is released into the blood. And oxytocin causes the uterus to contract harder and more frequently. And what do you got to do when the kid pops out? You got to feed them. So oxytocin also begins the production of milk in the breast. See how that works? The other hormone that it releases is antidiuretic hormone. So the hypothalamus produces antidiuretic hormone and it gets released by the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland, even though it's not part of, it's not neural, it is considered part of your limbic system. So you got the hypothalamus. Then you have the thalamus. We'll talk more about that. I'm just telling you the parts of the limbic system. Then you have the hippocampus. Hippocampus comes from the Latin word uh, seahorse because the hippocampus looks like a seahorse. So. If somebody says you look like a hippocampus, that's a slam. Who wants to look like a seahorse? And then you have the uh, amygdala, and then the, uh, the last, uh, that's it, that's it. So. The limbic system is really the seat of our emotion. This is where you get pissed, where you get happy, where you get horny, all in the limbic system. Now, the hippocampus and the amygdala are involved in producing memories. The hippocampus is involved in storing long-term memory, and long-term memory is um, stored throughout your brain. Short-term memory is stored in the amygdala. Now watch. How many people have ever been in a car accident or some like really kind of traumatic event? You know how they say it, it, it <coughs> seems like time slowed down, right? You, like you could actually see it happening kind of in slow motion. That's because it actually does to you. Again, the body does stuff that makes sense. So when something traumatic is happening to you, time for you actually slows down. And that's the result of the hippocampus and the amygdala. And it allows you to capture more of that traumatic event. So the more the traumatic event, the more of it you remember. So people who say they suppress these traumatic events and memories of them, they don't. As a matter of fact, they remember them better than any of their other memories because of the effect of the hippocampus and amygdala. What they do is they have coping mechanisms to not think about them, but when they do think about them, they are extremely vivid as if it happened yesterday. It's the same thing. It is the, uh, it's the exact same thing. And <clears throat> what happens is that people, a lot of times, they just don't have very good coping mechanisms for it. And like stuff that happened to you, let's say as a kid, something very traumatic happened to you as a kid, you remember it, but what you have done is you've developed coping mechanisms over your lifetime to deal with it and not necessarily suppress it, but just not think about it. So. Uh, I told you that I'd walk to Beloit and I helped this uh, uh, lady, right? And 
she was abused, sexually abused by her brother and sister as a child, right? And she's dealing with this stuff now. <coughs> Anyways, her friend that she bought this big house with, I think the same thing happened to her. Because how she controls that or how she deals with it is this woman never sits down. Never. She's always working, always doing something, and that's what, that's, I, at least I believe, how people deal with it. They try to stay busy so they don't have to think about it. But the, uh, in those events, and, and what's really weird is the, like the lady that I helped with, Beloit, the way she was describing this stuff, it was as if it was yesterday. Like, it happened yesterday. So those, um, those memories are real. And uh, you don't suppress them, you simply cope with them. So that's the limbic system. The limbic system is also, um, it's uh, the reward and uh, uh, punishment uh, center, right? So this is where you get uh, satisfaction or you get pissed off if you're not satisfied. <coughs> Say yeah. Now, so what we're going to do is we're going to start at the brain stem and then I'm going to explain to you each area <coughs> of the brain stem and then I'm going to go globally, I'm going to give you some information about each lobe of the brain. So here we go. Again. The basic biological functions are in the brain stem. So starting from lowest to highest, here we go. You start here with the medulla. The medulla controls, as we know, breathing, right? Do you remember that? It also controls heart rate and blood pressure. In advance, I'll explain to you the motor, vasomotor center of the brain, and it's housed in the medulla. The other thing that the medulla controls very nicely is um, vomiting. Just so you know, the inner ear and the medulla are connected together. That's why if you spin a kid around or they go on a roller coaster and that fluid in their inner ear is getting all jacked around, it will stimulate the vomit reflex. So that's why if you throw up like on a roller coaster, you should sit in the back. I've had beef jerky and pieces of hot dogs ralphed on me. You ever get the, you know what's a really good one? Uh, the Hades, I think it's called at uh, Wisconsin Dells. That is so good. That's like the best coaster ever. Yeah. That's a cool one. I don't know. Again, every time you ask me about pregnancy or kids, I got nothing for you. Well, I'm well, I'll, I'll, look. I, what do I know? Just trying to, you know, just get along, retire. <laughs> I'll look it up for you. I'm just placating you. I won't even begin to think about looking it up. Okay, watch. Sass is really getting harsh. Sass. Yeah, I know, right? What do you got to lose? Yeah, right? Just let it all hang out, you know? There we go. Okay. Now you got the pons. The pons? The pons works with the medulla in terms of controlling breathing. We'll talk more about that in advance. The other thing that the pons has is it houses the reticular activating system. This is the part of the brain that tells you to go night-night and tells you to wake up. So watch. How many people work third shift? How many people sleep good during the day? No? Well, there's a reason why. It's light out. So when you go to bed, most people go to bed when it's dark out. You should write that down. 
And there is a part of your brain right over here, a little gland <coughs> called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland releases a hormone called melatonin. You've heard of melatonin? Melatonin then will turn off your reticular activating system. It will tell you to go to sleep. And how do you get the pineal gland to release melatonin is when you close your eyes and no, uh, and no light is getting into your eyes anymore. So if you're having trouble sleeping, one of the reasons that people don't sleep well at night is they leave the TV on, right, a little night light on. You want that room as dark as possible when you're sleeping because that will cause the release of more melatonin and turn off that reticular activating system. The reticular activating system also does something else to your skeletal muscle. It partially paralyzes your skeletal muscle. So when you go into the deepest part of sleep, which is called REM sleep, the restorative sleep, your muscles are partially paralyzed. So during that REM sleep, you're dreaming. And the brain doesn't know the difference between a dream and you actually doing something, right? That's why dreams sometimes seem real. But you don't want your body acting out your dreams. That's why it's partially paralyzed. There's a disconnect between people who sleepwalk in the reticular activating system in that they don't paralyze their skeletal muscles, so they get up and act out their dreams. Has anybody ever woken up and you know you're awake, but you still can't move? Yes. All the time. All the time? Ooh, a lot. Like, a lot. Like every day? Probably like, maybe like twice or three times a month, and it's scary to me. <laughs> There's something very wrong with you. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. It's just, that, that just happens. The, more, the tireder you are, the uh, more likely it's going to happen. But uh, I don't know, it never happened to me, but as I'm getting older, how many people take naps? Take a nap? Right. You feel like you're getting away with something, right? Anyways, you start getting these uh, uh, twitchy naps. You ever get these twitchy naps? Like you're sleeping, right? You're taking like a little nap in the afternoon, and all of a sudden it's like, bam! You're on, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. I hate that. I get these twitchy naps, man, and I had this one where my I, woke, I had a twitch, and it smashed my hand right into the headboard. My knuckles started <laughs> bleeding. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> and then you also get what's called the myoclonic jerk right before you go into, you fall asleep. And the myoclonic jerk is kind of the say, okay, look, here, buddy, boom. We're going to give you a little jolt. And now we're shutting you down for the evening. So that myoclonic jerk, when it's coming, you know that you're going to be falling asleep. And who, who likes sleeping? It, right? And like, I like, right when I know I'm about to fall asleep, I said, here it comes. Don't you like that? I like that. Yeah. Anyways, that's a reticular activating system. And that is involved in the sleep-wake cycle. So watch, and I tried to explain this to you. People will take melatonin over the counter for jet lag or they're switching shifts. It don't help too much. And the reason it don't help too much is that melatonin has to get from the blood into the brain. And that blood-brain barrier just won't allow that to happen. That's why the pineal gland is in the brain. So they're really ripping you off. So instead of buying melatonin, just give me half of what you would spend on melatonin, and I'm saving you money. <laughs> Jet lag? Just uh, make your room as dark as possible and try to go to bed at a regular time. I can't hear you. Do you take melatonin? Oh, yeah, I can, yeah. I, I never slept really uh, good on third shift, but I could go right to sleep. Sometimes on the way home, I'd be falling asleep, right? 
I'd be opening up the window when it's cold. I'd be yelling at myself, ah, ah, right? So you wouldn't fall asleep. And then a couple of times you kind of, and your mind gets really goofy when you're tired. Like, I can just close my eyes for a few seconds. <laughs> then you hear the rumble of the gravel, and you're like, hey. What if, I have a question. What if you don't sleep well all the time? Because a lot of times they say it's when you're, like, nervous about something. So, like, what stimulates that? I don't know. I don't know. So you must be sleepwalking a lot because no, you, I can I tell you're to, very nervous about this I class. Used to a lot. <laughs> I used to if you're not, you should be, just so you know. Like I have like fall, I roll down the stairs and I had a concussion when I was like two. Oh. I used to sleepwalk all the time. But when I was younger, it's like I like I grew out of it. It's not. Like I used to do that too. But I, I did. Like I would do it like before the first day of school when I was younger, like all like things that made me like nervous or scared. I, I'm not sure. I'm really not. Talk to a psychologist. That sounds like a real problem. I, <laughs> I just kidding. Really, I don't know. Could be. Could be worse though. Could be happening to me. All right, here we go. <laughs> the hypothalamus we talked about. The thalamus. Now watch. The thalamus is above the hypothalamus. <laughs> Watch. The thalamus is the gatekeeper of your senses. It prevents you from essentially going insane. You don't want to attend to every neural stimuli that your brain is receiving. You would go insane. So what the thalamus does is the thalamus determines what sensory input is going to become conscious to you and what other sensory input is, look, I, 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 I don't want to deal with that. You got me? Even though you're feeling all these sensations, you're only, only a few of them are reaching conscious level where you say, okay, hey, that's something I got to deal with. Now watch, the best example I can give you of this is you're driving in your car, right? You always notice the same make and model of your car. And your thought is, look, that person must be cool too. Right? In a party, 500 people, everybody talking, right? Jessica. And people will, right? You will immediately attend to that because your name is important. You're following this. Now, let me give you an example of something that is the opposite of that. Right now, I'm talking to you about the thalamus, right? So when you get into advanced and I say, hey, uh, did you guys talk about the thalamus? You're like, no, 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 never heard that word once. Because you've decided that you're, it's not going to reach conscious level and you're not going to attend to it. Say yeah. So is that control like people like can't feel pain or something like that? Um, no. That, uh, it's called the congenital indifference to pain. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, they don't have uh, noxia receptors in their periphery. So they, they have damage. They just can't send that signal to the brain. There's a whole group of them it's like in like Western Europe or like Switzerland or something. There, there's like a whole village of people that have what's called congenital indifference to pain. The little kid, nine years old, walked around for a year on a broken ankle because he didn't know it was broken because he was, couldn't feel pain. Now, watch. Pain lets you know that there's something wrong, right? The old saying is, Doc, it hurts when I do this, don't do that. That's good advice. So pain immobilizes an injured joint because if you keep using it, you're going to make the injury worse. You got that? And the more pain you have, typically, the greater the tissue damage. So the, that's the thalamus. The thalamus only, the only sense that doesn't go through the uh, thalamus is the sense of smell. Everything else goes through the thalamus. So we talked a little bit about the amygdala and the basic function of the hippocampus and, uh, I mean, the limbic system and the hippocampus and the amygdala in terms of memory and emotion. 
and uh, reward, punishment, motivation comes there. So you guys need to motivate your amygdala last couple of weeks. Write that down. Then you have this area right here called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres of the brain. Now, very generically, the left side of the brain is more analytical. The right side of the brain is more artsy. Music interpretation, shapes, right, spatial relationships. Left side of your brain, math, analytic, writing, right, understanding, reading. So you're more than just two sides of your brain. You're the combination of those two. And what holds those two together or connects those two and allows you to be an, a relatively integrated person is the corpus callosum. And the neurons that make up the corpus callosum are myelinated, meaning electrical impulses can travel very quickly from each hemisphere of the brain. And those electrical impulses are typically controlled, modulated in terms of how much electrical activity actually crosses through the corpus callosum. There's some people, though, that can't regulate that um, electrical activity, and they have uh, epilepsy. And epilepsy is massive electrical discharge through that corpus callosum. And basically what that does is it causes massive electrical stimulation of both hemispheres of the brain and leads to an epileptic seizure. You ever seen an epileptic seizure? Just so you know, you can't swallow your tongue, right? Basically, when somebody's having a seizure, what you do is you try to get them to an area where, where they're seizing, that they're not going to hurt themselves, like break an arm, a leg, fall down, and that they're not going to break anything else. Just give them a clear path and let them seize. Once they're, the seizure is over, they go into what's called a post-ictal phase. You ever hear of it, post-ictal? Post-ictal is where the body is completely wiped out. The brain is completely wiped out. The brain basically shuts down, and it also shuts down the body. How bad the epileptic seizure is will determine the length of time for that post-ictal phase. So if they have a mild one, the post-ictal phase is relatively short. A bad one, it can be uh, a couple of days or more, where they're just basically wiped out. So, so just like your computer and start Yeah. Yeah. Now, now look. To under, understand this stuff, in, again, it's not, it's not rocket science. If somebody has epilepsy and you're going to give them medicine to treat it, what do you think the medicine does? <coughs> it reduces the electrical activity of your brain. That makes sense, right? So what's the most common symptom associated with anti-convulsants, anti-seizure medication? Come on, think. Think. What the? That's close. Sleepiness. They're sleeping all the time. I had this lady. She was, she was on like 2.5 grams, 2,500 milligrams of Dilantin. And I looked at her. I go, you actually take all that. Yeah. I go, how are you awake? How are you sitting there talking to me? And she goes, my doctors asked me the same thing. I'm like, how are you awake? So that stuff is crazy. So it's the opposite for her? What's that? So it works the opposite No, I don't know what it was, but she's taking enough where she should be sleeping all the time. But her brain is probably soaking up so much of that dilantin to prevent those seizures. Because you can, it, dilantin is taken up through the blood-brain barrier, and you can actually see it in the brain. You can do a scan to see how much dilantin it's taken up, and she was taking up a ton of it. It's so ridiculous. Like that, she was like, "There's so like it's going so fast, but I might have just taken her." I don't know. She was just there was a lot of stuff wrong with her. 
She was the one lady that came in, and I can't walk up to people and say, do you have Cushing's? Right? She said, Tim, I, the doctor needs these blood tests. Can you do them? And I go, yeah. And before I looked at him, I go, you have Cushing's, right? And she goes, what? And I go, you have Cushing's disease, right? She goes, I've never heard that before. I go, well, you do. Well, how do you know? I go, Holiday Inn. I stayed at Holiday Inn. She was a big lady. She had the buffalo hump, right? And I said, have you ever been pregnant? And she said, no. I said, can I see your belly? I'm not being weird. When she lifted up her shirt, she had a big belly, and she had stretch marks all over her belly. I said, you have Cushing's disease. So I drew a cortisol level on her, and her cortisol level was through the roof. And in advance, I'm going to explain all this stuff. The doctors thought she was diabetic. It was because she had Cushing's disease. And once she was treated for Cushing's, she didn't have diabetes anymore. She lost a little back fat, but then she started developing seizures. Then she adopted this kid, and this kid would beat her up. Adopted him when he was like two, and now he was like 17 of them, and she would come in and just all beat up. And then she was married to a guy who was a crack addict, so as soon as he got his disability check, he would blow it on crack, and then after that was gone, he would steal her money. I'm like, what a life. I go, you need to get disability. They won't give it to me. I'm like, I'll be a witness for you. You're a mess. She finally got it. This lady could not work. She would have cerebral spinal fluid coming out of her nose. She would get these headaches, and then cerebral spinal fluid would come out of her nose. I didn't even know she's still alive. I had one lady there that she was diabetic. And I knew her for about 16 years. And so she started working there when she was 27. I said, if you keep taking care of yourself the way you're doing it, you'll never see 40. She died at the age of 41, two summers ago. She just would not take care of herself. Okay, so that's a corpus callosum, yep. All right, here we go. This is general, right? There are four lobes to the cerebrum. <laughs> the cerebrum is what separates us from the aminals. Do aminals drink from a cup? No. no. Do they talk? No. On Christmas they do. Do they wipe their butt when they take a dump? No. My girlfriend brought her dog down. It's a little dust mop dog. That thing just barked. <laughs> oh my God want that. Okay, here we go. Temporal lobe. Hearing. All right? Hearing. Also, the temporal lobe is also involved in um, spatial relationships. Right? The orientation of space. Spatial responsibility. You got it. Then you have the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is vision. That takes the visual stimuli for the optic nerves, converts it into images. Then you have the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is sensory primarily. It's also involved in what's called proprioception. Proprioception is knowing where your body is in relationship to space. Watch. Watch. Because of proprioception and the fact that my um, temporal lobe or my parietal lobe is working good, I know that my arm is up. That is proprioception. Knowing that your body parts are moving and know where uh, they are in relationship to space. Then you have the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is really the seat of our humanity. This is, allows us to reason we're the only species on the planet that knows that we're going to die at some point, right? I was driving here today. There was like a little bug flying. And it was just minding all its business, and then it splatted against my windshield. That bug did not know it was going to die today. But you know you're going to die at some point. Did you, do you know that? I'm not. I'm going to live forever. Because Gateway Technical College is going to keep me alive. They're going to have machinery. 
Uh, yeah, um, this is what allows us to do computations, right? Think much higher thoughts, not like general AMP. And this allows us to reason. So the limbic system is the emotional part of your brain. The frontal lobe is what prevents you from when people piss you off from beating their ass, right? Or killing them. They say, look, I could get in trouble and go to jail and beat Billy's butt buddy in prison. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to walk away. That's how it works. So, uh, and then uh, I did that. And then finally the cerebellum. The cerebellum in combination with the primary motor cortex that's located in the frontal lobe, the cerebellum coordinates and refines movement. And the neurotransmitter that helps coordinate that is uh, dopamine. So people, and dopamine is produced in an area of the brain called the substantia nigra, and people who do not produce dopamine end up with these herky-jerky, shuffling gait, shaky movements. They end up with Parkinson's disease. So damage to your brain and repeated concussions can damage this uh, substantia nigra, and they can end up with Parkinson's. That's why a lot of boxers, because they're living longer than they normally do, like uh, Muhammad Ali, Jerry Quarry, all of those guys end, ended up with Parkinson's due to repeated uh, concussions and brain damage. And a lot of ex-football uh, players, the same thing's happening to them because of concussions. And basically a concussion is a bruising of the brain. Say yes. There you have it. All right, let's end it there today. We did very good. If you want to take that extra time right now and start working in the lab, uh, by all means, remember on Monday, we will pick lab times, and then on Wednesday, we'll pick times for the oral final. And you guys decided that you would just come in basically as a mob, right, and go through. You didn't want to 15 minutes at each station, right? You didn't want that. Or come in two groups. Right. But you don't want to stay at a specific station for 15 minutes. You just want to go from one station to the other, right? Okay, great. That's what we'll do then. Okay. You can go back to that station. You can spend, you can spend your entire time at one station. You get the other stations wrong, but that's okay. So um, again, the lab's going to be open um, now until my class starts at 5:50. It'll be open tomorrow at 10. You'll have to go down to Nathan. Just ask him to open it up, and it will be open up until. Uh, Actually, tomorrow it'll be open up until 5:50. I've got to go to my uh, help my brother. He's getting some dental surgery done, so I have to start the IV in him because he won't let anyone else touch him. What about on Saturday? Uh, nine to noon. Okay. All right. I should. <laughs>